not safe. Not safe. Who are these pathetic individuals who feel they have to be treated as safe? at the university. What do they think university is for but to be confronted with the most advanced ideas in the world and to take or leave whether or not they agree with them. You do not go to university in order to be safe. You go to university in order to study, to learn, to think for yourself. Welcome to The Shape of Dialogue. In February 2023, Richard Dawkins asked me to host his New Zealand speaking tour. Today's podcast is the Auckland event, in which Richard discusses the scientific method, his recent book Flights of Fancy, and the debate surrounding the inclusion of non-scientific Māori mythological concepts in the New Zealand school science curriculum. Richard needs no introduction, but if anyone has been hiding under a rock for the last 50 years, here's a brief description of his contribution to the world. Richard Dawkins is a world-famous Oxford University evolutionary biologist. He has led an illustrious career as an influential scientist, author, public intellectual, and importantly, an ardent advocate for science. It's no exaggeration to say Richard is one of the greatest minds of our time, and through his many books and public engagement has positively changed millions of lives. Richard is a prolific and highly influential author, and one of the greatest writers of his generation. He has written 20 books, including The Selfish Gene, The Extended Phenotype, and The Magic of Reality. Throughout his career, Richard has been a strong critic of religion and views the existence of God as a falsifiable hypothesis. In The Blind Watchmaker, he debunks creationist claims that life is far too complicated not to have had an omniscient designer. And now it is my greatest pleasure and honour to bring you Professor Richard Dawkins. We are the luckiest people in the world because we're about to hear Richard Dawkins for an hour and a half. We're going to have an hour of conversation. Richard and I will be chatting. He'll be doing most of the talking. And then we'll have half an hour of questions. And what I want you to do is have your questions prepared Keep the questions nice and short and pithy, as Shakespeare said. The, uh, you know, it's all about the wit. Actually, I've forgotten what Shakespeare said, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, I would like you to put your hands together for one of the world's greatest thinkers, Richard Dawkins. So, welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to New Zealand. It's a long way to come, and we really appreciate it. Now, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little story. It's a story I heard from Richard. It's one of my favorite. I collect quotes. This is more than a quote, but it's my, one of my most favorite quotes. We all have a father or a mother. I'm going to use father. We all have a grandfather and a great-grandfather, and a great-great-grandfather, ad infinitum. Our 200,000th great-great-grandfather was a fish. More than that. Yeah, okay, more than that. Whatever the number. Um, So, Richard, how do we know that? How does the scientific method... It's a very approximate figure, of course. You have to... uh make a guess, and it's a very approximate guess. It's, the dating is done partly by means of um, radioactive dating of, of fossils, and we don't know the precise f- fossil that we're talking about, our, our, our fish ancestor, but we know roughly when it was, we're in the Devonian era, and you work out the number of generations and you think, well, um, in, in recent human history, we would have had about four generations per century, but then Earlier generations would have been more frequent. It's a very, very approximate guess, but it's, a, it's important to get that kind of perspective on, on you know, the, the idea that your, your 200 millionth great-grandparent, you would have served him up with tartar sauce and a slice of lemon. Um, it kind of brings it home. Yeah, well, you know, it's that thing, when we go fishing, are we, are we eating our relatives? So... Um, 
But what, what I really want to get to is, is it's the scientific method that has helped us discover these things. That's just one of, you know, almost an infinite number of, of you know, really important bits of information that we've discovered. How does the scientific method work? Oh, well, gosh. That's a, oh, somebody hasn't oiled this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, okay. Um, um, well, let's take this particular thing of dating this, this Devonian fish. Um, it's partly done with the molecular clock, where the molecular clock is, you make the assumption that um, most of the changes in the genes are non-selective. The important ones are selective, but, they're not, but the, most of the actual molecular changes are uh, non-selective, so that they tick away like a clock. You can actually time the number of uh, changes that have taken place between, say, ch chimpanzee, the common ancestor with chimpanzees and, and ourselves, um, by calibrating it, calibrating the molecular clock. And then you take a particular fossil where you know how old it is, um, like the common ancestor with, with monkeys, and you then calibrate the molecular clock according to the fossil record, and then you look at Devonian fossils. So it's a very systematic process where you seek for evidence and you bend over backwards to avoid biasing yourself in the direction of a particular hypothesis that you might have. In medical research, that's done with the, um, the double-blind control trial, um, where you're, say, comparing a, a, a drug with a control, an inert control, and neither the doctor, nor the nurse, nor the patient, nor the statistical analyst knows which is which of the control or the experimental dose. And of course, you do it a hundred times, and, and then you, you unlock the code. Only then do you unlock the code as to which was the experimental dose and which was the control dose. This is bending over backwards to avoid biasing yourself, because with the best will in the world, we are all in danger of being biased in favor of our pet hypothesis, or we may even be bending over backwards to be biased against it, because we're too scrupulous. The double-blind trial, control trial, is a way of completely eliminating all possibility of subjective bias. It is objective. As near as possible, it is objective. As near as possible, we avoid personal feelings. As near as possible, we avoid respecting authority. The great Nobel Prize winning professor says so and so, never mind what is the evidence. It doesn't matter about the authority of a person who said something. What is the actual evidence? The scientific method is uh, scrupulously bending over backwards to avoid bias of all kinds. Right. Well, Richard Feynman said the easiest person to fall is yourself. He said... He said the easiest person to fall... To, to fall is, your, is, to is fall oneself. Is yourself, exactly. And, and so, essentially, the scientific method is, is transcending our bias. And it's a method that has worked rigorously for a very long time now, hasn't it? So... Uh, can you expand on, on the Enlightenment? Because that, that, the scientific method occurred in, in the, the paradigm of, of the Enlightenment. So, yeah, talk I'm about not, the Enlightenment. I'm not a historian, but my understanding is that the Enlightenment was the great movement of the 18th century, starting in the 17th century, um, where really the scientific method was developed. Um, and um, starting with people like Galileo and Newton in the 17th century and then going on to the great figures of the Enlightenment like David Hume um, and um, Adam Smith in, in, the, in, the, in the 18th century. And the, the tradition of the Enlightenment is one of active seeking skepticism, skeptical approach to, to the world um, and avoiding... Uh, holy books and holy traditions as far as possible. Right, right, right. And is, the, is our modern age a result of the Enlightenment? I suppose it is. I, 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 yes, I suppose it is. And, and um, unfortunately, we're seeing some resistance to the modern age and to the spirit of the 
enlightenment, a kind of rever reversion to revert to a spirit of personal feelings, of personal biases, subjective feelings, feelings that what matters is where you're coming from as an individual, what, what, what tribe you belong to, that kind of thing. All of which, the enlightenment, all of which the scientific method strove to depart from. Yes, so it's actually quite a, a substantial aberration from the normal human condition, isn't it? It's, it's historically a strange event, in a sense. Y yes, and, and um, it's, a, it's a problem that I see around the world at the moment. Can you elaborate on that? Well, yes. Um, well, for example, a, a biological journal just, to, just, I think, last week or the week before published a list of words which they would encourage us not to use. Um, Can you give us some examples? Well, survival of the fittest, um, which, as you know, is one way of putting Darwinian natural selection. Uh, Darwin used the phrase natural selection. Um, Wallace, his co-discoverer of natural selection, urged him to change to survival of the fittest, because that was Herbert Spencer's phrase, phrase because he thought that natural selection was too easily misunderstood. It, it, people felt, it, he, Wallace thought that people thought, felt that natural selection implied there had to be a deliberate selector. And so he felt that survival of the fittest was a better phrase to use. But this, these, I think they call themselves postmodernists, um, are now saying survival of the fittest is discriminatory against people with disabilities. Similarly, I've just been talking about the double blind trial. That's discrimination against blind people, or rather people of defective vision, whatever one is supposed to say in, instead. They list, published a list of about 20 words which we're not supposed and, to use. And survival of the fittest was one survival of them. Survival of the fittest is one of them. Oh, no, no. Um, and, um, and double blind trial and, is another. And, and they have anointed themselves as the people who can decide these things? I think that's a fair phrase to use, anointed themselves, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, um, there won't be any words left soon. Anyway, e evolution. What is evolution? How does it work? And, well, why, and why is it important for us to know about it well, it's as, why as we, lay people? It, it's why we all exist. Uh, it, it is um, it's the central theorem of biology. Uh, it explains the entire existence of life. Uh, it is, um, it was, the, in its modern form of, sur of survival of the fittest and natural selection, it was discovered by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace in the mid-19th century. Um, you cannot even begin to understand biology without it. You cannot, the idea of teaching biology without it is, is absurd. Uh, and um, unfortunately, there are people who try to do that and try to, to deny the importance of evolution in, in um, biology. It's why we all exist. It's the explanation for the complexity, the beauty, the illusion of design, which all living creatures show. It explains how we got to be the way we are, why we have brains big enough to understand where we came from. It's a wonderful privilege to be granted that understanding of where we came from, and Darwin and his successors gave us that understanding. In a sense, it's the original origins myth, even though it's not a myth. So it's, it's the, it, it, in a sense, it's the original origins story. Yes. Every, it is the only one. That's, well, yeah, that's right. I mean, every, every tribe all over the world has its own creation myth, and um, some of them are very beautiful and of great poetic value. But only one of them is true. And that is evolution by natural selection. Um, so it really does have a special status. Um, uh, it's not just another creation myth with, with the same status as any other. It is the only one which is actually, which has evidence in, in its favor. Hmm. It goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, how the scientific method works means we can prove that evolution is true. Um, I've heard a number of times people have said to me that science is just another story. 
it, it, it is another story. It's not just another story. It is another story that has the evidence in its favor. And if the evidence turned out not to favor it, then we would change the story. That's one of the things we do in science, is we, we, we hold to the best story that's available at present, fitting the evidence. If new evidence comes along which contradicts that story, then we change the story. Uh, and um, some stories have been changed, but um, I bet my shirt, all my shirts, that this particular story is not going to, ch going to change, and each will change in detail. It is changing in detail. But the fact that we are descended from fish is not going to change. The fact that we are cousins of chimpanzees is not going to change. Um, the fact that we're cousins of snails and earthworms is not going to change either. Yeah, well, we're all related, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right back to the beginning of time. Uh, yeah, I, I push back on you on that. I wouldn't use the word story. I'd use the word explanation, because in a sense, a story is, is, is more likely to be fictional. Yes. Because it's really I, a series of explanations. Yes, I would call it an explanation. Um, I don't object to the word story. I mean, we are storytelling animals, and we enjoy telling stories. And, yeah. and um, I try in all my books to tell stories. Um, I think it, 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 just that they're true stories, because they're supported by evidence. Yeah. A key part of science is being able to come up with a hypothesis and make predictions and then either prove those predictions right or wrong. Can you expand on how that works? Yes. Um, this is the sort of philosopher of science view of how science proceeds, and, and it sort, sort of is. Um, you, you come up with a hypothesis. This is the way it might be. You then deduce what the world should look like. For example, what experimental results you should expect to see if that story, if that, theory, if that theory, that hypothesis, that model were correct. This particularly works well in physics, where theoretical physicists come up with a, with a hypothesis, and they then do math, a lot of mathematics to deduce some predictions. And then experimental physicists go and test the predictions. Um, in the case of quantum theory, this is rather interesting, because the the theory of, of, the, of quantum mechanics is so far removed from what the human mind is capable of comprehending that many physicists say they don't even try to comprehend it. They just say, shut up and calculate. Um, they then do calculate that what would be the, what, what predictions would follow, what predictions would follow from their latest version of the theory. And then experimental physicists, who are a sort of separate breed, build apparatus and go away and test those predictions. And what's remarkable about the predictions of quantum theory is that although they're incomprehensible to the human mind largely, if you deduce mathematically the predictions from them, then those predictions are verified to the umpteenth decimal place. And by umpteenth decimal place, I mean with an accuracy equivalent to measuring the width of North America, or I might as well say Australia or any other place, the width of North America to, the, to one hair's breadth. Now, if you can predict something that is thousands of miles to an accuracy of one hair's breadth, there's got to be some truth in the original model that made those predictions, even if the human brain is not capable of comprehending exactly what's going on in the original hypothesis. And in a way, it's presumptuous of us to even expect that we should understand it. Uh, it's, um, our brains, after all, are the products of Darwinian natural selection on the African plains. Uh, and they are equipped to do nothing more advanced than find the next prey, or the next waterhole, or the next cave to live in. And somehow, remarkably, a brain that was evolved to do that finds itself capable of doing relativity, doing quantum theory, doing evolution, doing logic, doing music, doing poetry. Um, that, that is a remarkable fact. It's an emergent property of the human brain. But it's presumptuous of us to expect that we necessarily should understand every detail of the way nature works. And I think mostly we don't, 
But nevertheless, physicists can deduce predictions from these incomprehensible theories. And the predictions then are satisfied to this astonishing level of accuracy. Going back to Richard Feynman, I, I don't know if, uh, if people know who Richard Feynman is, but he's one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century. He said, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't. Yes, that's right. Uh, he also, he's one of several people who, who's said to have said that. Yes. yes. And you, you would agree? I mean, not that you're a physicist. Well, but, uh, it's, a, it's a fine statement. It's an, it's an excellently yeah. witty statement. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I mean, the other thing he said about the scientific method was he said, first we guess and then we work out. Yes. You know, whether that's true or not. Yes, yes. And, and so uh, I'm very interested in the relationship. You know, I, I'm a musician. I'm an, you know, a creative person in that sense. But when I look into science, it's, to me, it seems like a very creative endeavor. Sure, you have got the, the technical side of doing the experiment, but you have to come up with an experiment, with a hypothesis. Am I correct? Is it a creative process? It is it's very creative, yes. Uh, and, and, and especially the a particular philosophical way of putting it that I, that, that I Sorry, just... Sorry, a philosophical way? F- philosophical way of putting it that I, I just said, where, yes. you, where you have a model that you then deduce predictions from. The having the model is something that comes from your head. It's, it, it is a, a creative pr- process. Um, yeah. Newton got this all wrong. I mean, Newton... Newton said hypotheses non fingo. I do not make hypotheses. Of course he made hypotheses. Um, that's exactly what he did. Uh, he tested them as well. Right. Um, but um, that, that is one of the, the main things that scientists do is the creative stage of having an idea, a brilliant idea. So as a scientist, in a sense, it's interesting about Newton. I, I didn't know that. You don't actually have to know how science works to be a scientist in, in that sense. You, can have a, you could have a different sense. Is, is that a correct well, statement or not? Well, you, I think you have to know how it w- works. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I'm mean, just interested, how, how could he say that, he was, in a sense, he's saying he didn't follow the scientific method? Who? who Newton. Newton. Um, I don't know. I think he, I think he sort of thought that, that, that having hypotheses was a kind of airy-fairy thing that scientists didn't do, I think, a bit, yeah. bit obviously. I mean, t- take, um, for example, the, the double helix DNA, which is on my tie. Um, what Watson and Crick did was to make models. They literally made models out of cardboard, and, and they would fiddle around with these cardboard models um, they were of, informed of what, of what they thought it was going to be. This is yes. before they had the photograph. Yes. I mean, they, they was constant in interplay with what was already known. The the data that was known came from crystallography, which is where you make a crystal of the unknown substance, in this case DNA, and you shine X-rays through it, and you look at the pattern that's produced by the um, by the X-rays, and you have to un- understand a bit of crystallography, and then. You have, a, you have a, a hypothesis, and Linus Pauling, who was their great rival, and you read all about this in Watson's book, The Double Helix, Linus Pauling had a, a model which was a triple strand, right. and um, he thought that would work, and it didn't. And then um, Watson and Crick uh, made models of a double-stranded helix, and there's a wonderfully dramatic moment. And have anybody seen the film of the of the BBC film of the Double Helix? Um, many of you probably read Watson's book. But there, there's a moment when when Crick is off in the corner reading or something, and Watson is playing around with cardboard models of purine and pyrimidine, which are the two uh, bases which which can connect across from one he- one helix to the other. And he was fiddling around with these cardboard models, and suddenly it fitted. Uh, and it was a most dramatic goose pimpling moment when he called across to Francis Crick. And then the next scene in the film was them bounding into the Eagle pub in Cambridge, and Crick announcing, we have discovered the secret of life. And they had. They really had discovered the secret of life. They had discovered um, 
not only that DNA is a double helix and, and that you have these purines and pyrimidines that pair across the double helix, but they had uh, immediate, they immediately realized that this explained genetics. This explained how the, 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 their throwaway remark at the end of their famous paper in, in Nature was, it has not escaped our notice that what we've just discovered immediately suggests a, a, a mechanism for genetics. It's a wonderful understatement. I suppose you could call it British understatement. It has not escaped our notice. That was just a throwaway line at the end of the... And they could have expanded on that and, and explained why, but, but that, was, that was not necessary. It was, it was... So, so they were making these, essentially these jigsaw puzzles, sort of 3D jigsaw puzzles, and once they found out a way of, of connecting it, that was the solution. Yes, it was, the solution was so neat that it had to be true. I think that's probably right. the right way to put it. Right, right, and right. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, who, who provided inadvertently, uh, because Watson could be said to have stolen some of her data, um, she came and saw that their, they, they built a proper model then yeah. at, of, of, of the thing, and she came and said how beautiful it was, and, and, um, and indeed it, it right. was. Right. Crick describes how... Watson was invited to give a talk afterwards, and he got drunk. And all he said in his talk was, but it's so beautiful, it's so beautiful, it was all he could say. And I think that was the occasion when Crick introduced Watson to somebody else and, in Cambridge, and the man said, but I thought your name was Watson Crick. <laughs> <laughs> that relationship between beauty and science is an interesting one, because you often hear... Um, uh, scientists talking about, like, I think it was uh, Einstein, you know, he, he came to an equation and it, he sensed the beauty in the equation and so he's, so in a sense, deducing truth. I mean, I'm afraid it, that's right. I mean, it, it, in a way, that's not entirely respectable, but it, it is right. That's how physicists work. Um, Einstein was asked, um, you probably know the story of how Eddington um, went out to uh, to watch to, to the South Atlantic to to look at a total eclipse of the sun because that was the only way you could see whether Einstein's prediction that starlight would be bent by the gravity of the sun. You, you can't do that unless there's an eclipse because the starlight is, is dazzled. Is, 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 and Eddington came back from this island in the South Atlantic and reported that Einstein's prediction was correct. And somebody said to Einstein, what would you have said if Eddington had disproved your prediction? And Einstein said, then I would, be, I would have been sorry for the dear Lord. The prediction, sorry, then I would have been sorry for the dear Lord. The theory is correct. That's not really the way you're supposed to do it, but, but that's the physicist's faith in the beauty of theory. Right, right. The other thing... It what was interesting about your story with the, or the story with the du double helix, is the the competition between their rivals. How can you talk about the competition in the science community and how that is is actually in a yes. sense positive? I think this is the the dark side of science in a way. It it it, it is competitive, and um, this comes across very much in Watson's book, The Double Helix, and his other books as well. Um, they were intensely competitive and uh, they were um, not above, as I said, sneaking previews of Rosalind Franklin's data, which against her knowledge, that kind of thing, and they were felt triumphant when Linus Pauling got it wrong. They had a sort of quizzling in the camp because Pauling's son was actually working in Cambridge with them, and so they, they had a kind of spy on, on Pauling. And, and this... Um, this intense competition, I think it's probably fermented by the intense prestige of the Nobel Prize uh, and, and such ambition to win a Nobel Prize. Um, I think the very greatest of scientists, or not, I can't say that, but some of the very greatest of scientists have eschewed competition and welcomed. I think J.B.S. Haldane who was a very cussed character in many ways, but he he at least had the virtue that he didn't mind getting whether he got credit for his ideas as long as the ideas were, right. were out there. And, and yeah. that, that, I think, is very laudable and un unusual. 
Well, I, I learned something very profound when I interviewed Jerry Coyne, the famous American biologist. He said that scientists are people. That, that scientists are people. Yes. And so yes, they're going to be, they're going to have a range of, of human characteristics that, yes. that we all have. That's, that's right. They're, they're, not, they're not Dr. Spock, which no. I think is a common, uh, you know, common impression that scientists are. We're, that's what we're fed in movies often. Yeah. Um, I mean, e even Haldane was, was a very difficult man. He, he, um, he, he had a furious temper and the, the cleaners would never clean his room because they were so terrified of him in, in that kind of thing. He, was, he, was a, um, he, he once bicycled across no man's land in the First World War because he calculated correctly that the Germans would be too startled to shoot him. <laughs> Well, he's obviously right. Um, okay, so um, Richard has recently written a, a book called Flights of Fancy, and unsurprisingly, it's all about flight. Uh, I've just read it. Uh, you should all go out and buy it. It's fantastic. So um, in it, you talk about the indigo booby. Uh, tell, this, tell, tell, tell that, if we can yes, use the word um, story. This tell is a lovely story. story. Um, the indigo bunting, it's a oh, North, bunting, yeah. North American bird, um, and it, it migrates by night, and it navigates by the stars. And uh, Stephen Emlin at Cornell University uh, demonstrated this in a planetarium. Uh, he put his birds in a cage which had a funnel at the bottom. So at the bottom of the, of the cage was a, an ink pad, black ink, and then there was a funnel of paper, and then there was a cage at the top. And um, the birds were, wanted to migrate, and so they would be, their feet would be all covered with ink from the ink pad, and they would be struggling to get out of the cage in the direction that they wanted to migrate, which happened to be, I think it was southwest. And so then he could look at the paper funnel afterwards and see all these footmarks on the southwest side of the paper. That was his assay for the direction they wanted to migrate. Now, the, he put the cage in the, in the middle of a planetarium, and then he could manipulate... I don't know how he got, managed to borrow a planetarium, but that was <laughs> very fortunate. He then manipulated the night sky, and blotting out various bits of it, manipulating it, and he showed... That they were, that they knew about constellations, they knew where to find the North Star. As you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, there is a star right over the North Pole, um, Polaris, which is a way of telling where North, where North is. Even if there wasn't, I mean, you, there's a patch of sky which is which is in 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 the North, um, and in the Southern Hemisphere, you have a patch of sky where where is it? Um, and so he showed that they were using the stars. So the next question was, how do they know? How do they know which constellation is which? Do they have built into their genes a knowledge of how to find the North Star? I mean, we're all taught in the Northern Hemisphere, we, you find the North Star by taking the, the saucepan, the plow, um, the, the great bear. And two of the stars there point to Polaris, the North Star. That's how we do it. Um, is, is that how, how they were doing it? Well, they were using that. They were using various constellations. But how did they know? Was it genetic? Well, he, he discovered it was not genetic. What it was, was something rather interesting. Um, they were watching the rotation of the night sky as the Earth rotates. And there has to be one spot in the, in the sky which doesn't rotate because that is directly over the pole. And so what they were doing was noticing which part of the night sky did not rotate. And he showed that by, building, by bringing up baby birds in the planetarium, in, in the cage in the planetarium. So these baby birds had the opportunity to watch the night sky rotating in the planetarium. But he rotated the night sky for half the birds, not around Polaris, but around Orion's left shoulder. And those birds 
when they grew up and, and started to show migrating tendencies, they demonstrated that they were treating Orion's left shoulder as though it was Polaris, as though it was the North Star. And that's a beautiful experiment, and it's a lovely um, testing of a hypothesis uh, and extremely neat and sh shows exactly one, one finding. You can't depart from that finding. The birds aren't using the scientific method, are they? What, they, they well, and, 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 and no, I mean, they're, what, they're what are not, they doing? actually. They're, they're making a deduction. They're deducing something, aren't they? Yeah. They're extrapolating some information. I think, we, I think we want to make a distinction between using... Um, in a way, it's more like technology. It's, it's using a skill. It's using a technique. Um, it's rather like um, uh, the skill of a plumber or a carpenter who knows how to use a chisel or knows how to um, clear a drain or whatever it is, um, but doesn't really understand the theory of it. Um, they, I mean, if they could talk, they couldn't tell you that those lights in the sky are stars. Well, they don't know what the stars are. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. They're yes. just a thing. So if, if they were scientists, they would, they would have a theory for what stars are, and, and, and so you, you can... Well, I mean, humans use the stars for navigation. Well, well, that was the next thing I was going to talk about. You know, one of the greatest feats of humankind is what the Poly Polynesian, the ancient Polynesian mariners did. They found every rock in the Pacific without any satellite, yes. without any GPS, yes. without a sl not yeah. even a slide rule or a sextant. Um, Polynesians are, of course, um, among the great navigators of history, and, mm. and, and uh, certainly they were using stars, among other things. Um, but again, they probably didn't have a correct theory of what the stars were. They probably thought they were the God knows something about the God, great God so-and-so or whatever. Right. Um, and, but that didn't matter because, because you can still use the stars by, by observing um, and noticing and, and developing a practical skill of how to use the stars even if you believe that they're just lights hanging in the sky just above the treetops, and yeah. um, um, they're, they're still, you can still, still use them. But true science develops a theory for what the stars are. Yes. And, and yeah. Yeah, so it, it's the, the difference between pattern recognition of, of, of essentially variables that don't vary, like stars. Mm -hmm. So the difference between pattern recognition and actually saying, these are stars, These how, this is how they work, this is how far away they are, this is how many there are. Yes. So it's, a, it's an explanation rather than um, using it as a tool. Because essentially for a, a, a mar the ancient mariners, the stars were just a tool. We were only relatively recently in the last few centuries known what the stars were, of course. And yes. It's, um, well, um, uh, you know, I was, was it Lord Calvin, the... English for the 19th century physicists, didn't they think that you know the sun was made of coal or something like that? Be before Rutherford split the atom, <laughs> yes, um, um, they had they couldn't work out how the sun. Yeah, I think we're talking so about Lord sun. Kelvin. Kelvin, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Ke Kelvin was a great physicist, a great uh, Scottish physicist, um, and he actually gave Darwin a hard time because he calculated that uh, the the sun had not been was not old enough to allow enough time for evolution to occur. And that's because he thought the sun was actually burning. Um, yes. and, and if you calculate how much fuel there must be in the sun to keep, to keep burning, um, there would not have been enough time. It would only be in a few million years, which is not enough time for evolution to take place. Um, but because, of course, this was before it was known that the sun was actually... Um, a, a nuclear a, a bomb. A nuclear, <laughs> yes. Um, and I think it fell to Darwin's son, George Darwin. Um, he was one of those who actually was able to refute Kelvin right. after Charles Darwin's death, unfortunately. But that would have right. been a nice uh, right. thing. Right. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's an important distinction between pattern re recognition and science and, and technology and science. You want to just talk more about technology, especially in a sense, um, pre-scientific technology? That, that difference between technology and science? Well, I suppose technology would be applied science, and, and um, uh, there are 
So we, when I mean technology, I'm, I'm talking about in the broadest possible sense. So uh, an, an ancient Greek urn, that's not applied science, is it? Is what, that, what is it? An ancient Greek urn, it, that's, no. that's not applied science, but it is a technology. Yes, it is. Um, I mean, Lancelot Hogburn, who wrote a book called Science for the Citizen, Mathematics for the Million, his thesis was that um, science was driven by technology, that, 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 yeah. that cultures develop science as a, res as a result of technological needs. Um, that's just his, his thesis. It's, well, it, it's symbiotic, isn't it? It's symbiotic. So, it's yes. sort of, you know, if you have an electron microscope, you can do so much more science than, than without one or yes. with a, 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 just a, yes. a, an optical yes, one. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, are you all hearing all right? I, I, it, 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 good, I'm glad to hear that. We just so, so you know, the sound is absolutely terrible for us. We can barely hear each other. Is everyone aware of a recent debate that's been going on about whether traditional Māori knowledge, mataranga Māori, is science or not science? Put your hands up if you are aware of that. So it's basically frickin' everyone. Even I'm aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't have to explain about the, the professors who wrote an In Defense of Science letter. You all know about that? Yep. And then there was a response to it, um, which was called um, very uncreatively the response to the letter In Defense of Science. We, we're going to talk about that. If you do need more information about it, um, it's on my podcast's uh, me Medium uh, page. So just go to medium.com and type in shape of dialogue, shape of dialogue, all one word. And there's everything you need to know there. So it's an important subject as the current New Zealand government is or has instantiated Mataranga Māori, Mataranga Māori valence over the whole curriculum. The aim is to make Mataranga Māori equivalent to, I, I use the word so-called, in inverted commas, Western knowledge. Um, so we're going to talk about one example in the curriculum, and it seems like this is just the tip of the iceberg. So here's an example from the uh, new chemistry and biology curriculum. I'm going to quote an extract from it. So here we go. Commence studies with an exploration of Māori and what this means for the environment and what Māori means within the context of the body as we embark on chemistry and biology in the health sciences. Now, just out of interest, does, do people know what Māori is? M-A-U-R-I. So it's only a few. Okay, well, I'll, I'll read the definition from the curriculum. And again, forgive me for my bad pronunciation. Māori is present in all matter. All particles have their own Māori and presence as part of a larger whole. For example, within a molecule, polymer, salt, or metal. When matter is broken into smaller particles, each particle remains as part of the taiao, which means environment. For example, when a substance is burnt or dissolved, the particles remain with their own moldy. What are your comments about including such a concept in the nation's science curriculum? Well, I, it sounds to me like vitalism, um, and vitalism is a wholly discredited scientific theory. Um, we now understand that life is mechanistic. We now understand that life is nothing more than the interaction of atoms and molecules. And any reversion to a vitalistic or mystical or supernatural uh, explanation is 
highly deplorable. Um, I have been reading a little bit about this matter, not a lot. I'm, I'm afraid I'm so somewhat ignorant about it, but I have been reading a certain amount. And I am aware that some distinguished New Zealand scientists have been penalized. I actually wrote something down here. This was the Putayo recommendations, the recommendations of the Putayo Committee of the School of Biological Sciences of Auckland University. And they're referring to uh, Kendall Clements and Garth Cooper, who are uh, distinguished New Zealand scientists. Um, we do not feel that either Kendall or Garth should be put in front of students as teachers. This is not safe for students or other staff involved in teaching the same course. Not safe. Not safe. What? Who are these pathetic individuals who feel they have to be treated as safe at university? What do they think university is for? but to be confronted with the most advanced ideas in the world and uh, to take or leave whether or not they agree with them. You do not go to university in order to be safe. You go to university in order to study, to learn, to think for yourself. I, I must confess I love this country. When, when people ask me, what is my favorite country in all the world? I always say New Zealand. I, that, that, is, that is true, that, that, that is true. Um, Ernest Rutherford has been described uh, in, in, in a recent issue of Scientific American, not that long ago, 2013, Scientific American said, along with Michael Faraday, Rutherford was the greatest experimentalist in modern history and the 20th century's experimental counterpart to Einstein. So New Zealand has produced the greatest experimental physicist of the 20th century and should be proud of its scientific heritage. How can you betray your scientific heritage in this way? By taking what amounts to vitalistic superstition and instead of teaching it in history classes, in culture classes, in anthropology classes, where it should be taught, teaching it as science and of equal status to what is called Western science, which should not be called Western science. It's not Western science, it's just science. Science is human science. It belongs to the whole of humanity. Calling it Western science is an insult to, well, Japanese, Indian, Chinese science for a start, but in, ge in general, it's, it implies the kind of postmodern idea that science is a particular cultural prejudice of particular kind of people. It's not. It's, it's, how science, it's, it's how humans get to the truth. It's how humans get to the truth via evidence, via, via a skeptical, what we were talking about earlier, actually, in the beginning, a skeptical approach to evidence to elevate a... Uh, tribal culture it happens to be in, this, in, the, in these islands. If Maori science is great science, then it should be taught all over the world. It's not going to be true just in New Zealand. Science is everywhere true in the universe. It's not just true in New Zealand. So, I, well, I don't know if I'm talking to the right audience, but I, 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 I would beg New Zealand to depart from this folly. Amen. <laughs> well, I guess it's government, it's the government policy, isn't it? I think it would be interesting if I reread that thing from the curriculum. Commence studies with an exploration of the Holy Spirit and what this means for the environment and what the Holy Spirit means within the context of the body as we embark on chemistry and biology in the health sciences. So what, what you've done there is, is to substitute Holy Spirit, is that right, for, yes. for Mori? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, 
I don't think any of us would buy in for that, into that. I don't think you would buy into it. I don't think any of your eminent colleagues would buy into that. To me, it, there's no difference. Not even the Christian ones. Not even the Christian know. ones. Yeah. So the, the real... Okay, here's a question. If I was the current New Zealand Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, what would you say to me? If, if you were... If I was New Zealand's current Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, what would you say to me? If, if the Prime Minister was sitting in the seat, what yeah. would you say? Well, pretty much what I have just said. We'll say um, it again. <laughs> well, um, uh, science should be practiced according to the best scientific standards of humanity. And, and New Zealand is, has a distinguished record in, in science. And uh, just as I just said, do, do not debauch, do not pervert science by, by ele elevating indigenous so-called ways of knowing, and every, every people all over the world has had, had, had their ways of knowing. And as I said, they have a poetic beauty very often. I, I haven't studied the, the Maori myths, but I, I would imagine they might well have a poetic beauty. And they belong in the study of mythology, they belong in the study of history, they belong in the study of anthropology. They do not belong in the study of science. You are letting down the children of New Zealand of all races, by uh, forcing this contradiction, a sort of schizophrenic con contradiction of two incompatible ways of viewing the, the, the world and expecting the, the children to, to sort them out. I'd almost go as far as to say it's a form of child abuse to educate children this way. I would go on to say it, is, it will affect, it will harm the least advantaged more, which is ironic because I, I imagine these policies are instantiated to help the least advantaged. To help? To help the least advantaged. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. Getting back to the, the you know, what you talked about, those two, prof those two professors who were deemed heretical, the speech environment we live in, what, what are your experiences, what are your comments? You, you have been cancelled yourself, haven't you? Uh, yes, um, I have been cancelled. Um, uh, I'm trying to, think, trying to remember why now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the first time was in Berkeley, California, which is another place I love, and I lived there for two years. And um, I think I was cancelled there for so-called Islamophobia. Um, I, I'm not Islamophobic. I'm phobic against female genital mutilation. I'm phobic, phobic against throwing gay people off tall buildings. I'm, um, uh, and I regard the, the chief victims of the bad aspects of Islam as Muslims themselves. Um, so that was the first cancellation. Um, then I had, um, a, yes, an, an American humanistic organization, which I think sometime in the 1990s gave me an award, the Humanist of the Year Award. And last year, maybe it was, maybe the year before, they took that award away from me. <laughs> um, because, um, and what was that about? Um, yes, uh, because I pointed out that um, there was a woman in America who wished she was black, and it turned out that she wasn't. <laughs> um, and, uh, but she um, dressed, to, to have had her hair done and looking, and, and she, she sort of, as it were, identified as black. And she was universally vilified for this. And I contrasted her with, with I, I said, on the one hand you have her, on the other hand you have people who, uh, uh, people with a penis who identify as, as a woman um, and they get praised and glorified. And I simply said, discuss. <laughs> you know, discuss the, this juxtaposition of two facts. I didn't say, come on, any, on, si on any side rather, but simply saying the word discuss of such a matter was enough to get me cancelled. 
Um, I think those are the two times I've been right. cancelled. Oh, no, there was a third time. <laughs> um, uh, a few years ago, and they, um, after a couple of months, climbed down and... and they, they, that's right, they, I, I, I was disinvited to a conference for some similar reason. And then they climbed down and, and re-invited me again. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Well done. I'm going to read out a part of a letter from an incredibly promising Māori PhD student. This relates to the speech environment we're currently in, and it also relates to the effects of these policies on a Māori student. This student came from an extremely disadvantaged family. I won't go into details, but this is exactly the person the government is trying to help. And it relates to um, what someone has given me this term recently, the indigenization of universities and those current policies. Here we go. Kia ora. This makes me feel uneasy and anxious having different opinions. If their aim is to make Māori comfortable at the university, they are doing a horrible job. They are only making the university safe for a subset of Māori that agree with them. I feel like I am forced to believe in their ideas or else I could be attacked or kicked out. It is as if though they are trying to control the way I think. Namihi. So that is from, again, I'll reiterate, from an incredibly promising individual. I won't say who they are. Almost unbelievably, he not only gave me this, but said I could put his name to it. I've decided that it would be a career suicide um, if I put a name to it, so I'm not. But what does that tell you, or what does that tell us, the fact that someone would write that, then I would refuse to put his name on it? What does that tell us about our speech environment? Well, it, it, it suggests that um, somebody like that might be in danger of bullying, um, might be in danger of, well, cancelling. Um, I think I don't know too much about whether that sort of bullying goes on here, but I know that um, in other parts of the world uh, where the dispute is different, but the motivation may be similar. Um, bullying goes on. Um, the Scottish writer J.K. Rowling, author of Harry Potter, um, is subject to truly vicious witch hunts, death threats, um, and um, people trying to stop her books being published and that kind of thing. Um, there is a kind of religious zeal among a certain kind of political activist in the world today, which recalls to my mind the heresy hunting witch hunts of the Middle Ages um, and the ruthless hunting out of heretics. Uh, I, I don't know whether this young man has been um, subject to that kind of pressure, but I, I, possibly reading between the lines, there's a, there's a, a danger of that. Um, there's also, I don't know whether it applies here, but in parts of, I think in America, there's a patronizing sort of low expectation. Um, I think there's a sort of feeling that certain kinds of people ought not to be expected to learn mathematics or learn to read or that kind of thing, which is, which is patronizing and condescending uh, and insulting, actually. Um, I, does that go on here? Is there, is there, a, is there a feeling about...? Well, 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 yeah, you answer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, amazingly, George W. Bush said this, he, he termed it the soft racism of low expectations. Low expectations, okay, yeah. yes. And, yes. Soft and, racism of low expectations. 
a good phrase, even if it does come from George <laughs> W. Bush. <laughs> someone, someone said to me it was probably one of his speech writers. So, okay. Yeah. That, that makes it better. <laughs> it shows my prejudice. Now, I want to move back to your new book, Flights of Fancy. You um, dedicated it to someone called Elon. I presume that is Elon Musk. This was before he became that famous. I, I didn't know he was going to become the richest man in the world. <laughs> um, and um, uh, I, I thought he, his ambition to fly to Mars and to um, colonize Mars was, was ambitious in a good sense, in the sense, sort of sense as, as um, uh, the discoverers of the new world. Um, uh, um, Christopher Columbus, Captain Cook, uh, um, well, pe people the, who... the Polynesian mariners. Or the Polynesians, and, and indeed, um, in, in Flights of Fancy, uh, Jana, the illustrator, who's here tonight, um, drew a picture of a Polynesian canoe um, discovering an island. And this was to illustrate the spirit, which I'm, I'm talking about, the outward urge, um, which I thought Elon Musk uh, personified at the time. Um, and um, he's since become extremely well known in the world, and, and I probably would have hesitated to, to um, <laughs> dedicate it if, 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 if I'd known. Uh, um, but you, you have to give credit where credit is due. Sorry? You, you have, we must give credit where credit is due. Yes. What he's doing is amazing. What? What, what Elon is doing with SpaceX yes. and the, the whole concept. What, what I like about what Elon is doing, he views it as inspiring humanity. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and talking about inspiring humanity, uh, I get the sense you're very pro-human. Pro? Pro-human. Humanist. You, no, you're, you're pro-human. So you're positive about humans. Yes. What I'm sensing from a lot of young people that I, 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 you know, friends of mine, they're very negative about humans and the effect that humans are having on the planet. What, what was, you know, what, when I read your books, I'm inspired, and I'm inspired especially with flights of fancy on the section about human flight. I mean, I just flew up from Wellington yesterday, and you get on a plane, it's like a bus. You take it for granted. After reading that book, I'm looking at the wing, and I'm thinking, it is incredible. Now, that has been done through, by humans with the scientific method to create something incredibly, what I see is incredibly magnificent. Do you, so do you want to comment on that? Well, I think it's astonishing that uh, it's only... Um, just over a century uh, since the Wright brothers first did, did a powered flight. Uh, and it was only just over half a century between the Wright brothers and when Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon. Um, so uh, when Homo scientificus really gets going, um, they produce astonishing results. And, and um, really the all the misgivings that we have about climate change and, and mass extinction and things, you sort of feel could be solved if the scientific method were applied. Uh, and uh, the, to, for me, the, the worrying thing is not that the, the, the science is, is absent, the science is there. The problem is the political will to implement it. And that, that means all of us, I don't mean professional politicians only, I, I mean the whole of us as democratic citizens. Um, we, we, we need to have the will to put into practice what the best minds in the, in the world can tell us, um, the best method in the world can, can tell us what, what needs to be done. Um, so uh, on the one hand, I think we do have to worry very much about the effect that our species is having on the planet. On the other hand, um, we sort of have a track record. We, by humanity, Homo scientificus, um, has a track record of, of finding out what the solution is. 
we're problem solvers. And we tend to solve problems. Mm. Yeah. Now, to conclude, sadly, we have to conclude. It's gone so quickly. You've had a very long and very brilliant career as a biologist. Is your mind still blown away by what evolution has created? Yes, absolutely. Totally blown away. <laughs> I, I think, the, 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 in a way, the longer I live, the more blown away I become. Um, it is quite astonishing that on this planet, maybe on, only this planet, but I doubt that, but it's possible only this planet, somehow the laws of physics, the laws of atoms bouncing off each other, have produced us um, by this very pr special process of evolution by natural selection. Um, and I, I actually believe it, the same process is going on on other planets around the universe, but we may never know that. But it is a most remarkable process. And um, this century is a very, very exciting century to be a scientist. And uh, I encourage all young New Zealanders to think about a, a career in science, by which I mean real science. Thank you, Richard. Okay.